His child and forever I am. Amen. It's good to be with you all. It's been some time since I've had an opportunity to stand before a congregation and deliver a message. So uh, I'd ask your patience with me as I go back through uh, some of this and try to get my old sea legs back. Uh, if you were here this morning, I gave a, a short hint at this evening's lesson. We we're going to talk a little bit about worry and stress. I don't know if any of you have had any experience with that, but I have at one time or two in my life had an opportunity to deal with great levels of stress and, and anxiety and worry and all of those other things. But I know that that is not uh, uncommon. The scripture tells us that we don't suffer anything that is not common to man for uh, many of us, we've had some times in our lives where we wish things maybe were a little bit different or maybe we wish the road or the pathway was slightly easier. Uh, I wish I'd been maybe prepared a little better as a young adult for the challenges I would face as an older adult. And maybe I was. I just probably wasn't listening, to be quite honest. Uh, as a young man, I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof, and there wasn't going to come a time when anything was really going to stand in my way. But as I've gotten older and had a chance to explore life a little bit more and uh, had a few more experiences and circumstances come my way, it's realized that stress and worry is a thing for everyone. So I want to go through some verses tonight and talk about the consequences of worry and some of the effects that that might have on you or me or uh, even our, our faith, right? Even our walk with Christ can be affected by our stress or our worry. Um, if it hasn't happened to you, praise God. I pray that that continue for you. But if it has, then I think the passages tonight you read and that we read together might aid some comfort along the way for that and might arm us better that when situations and trials come our way, we might be a little bit more well prepared for those things. I know that in my life, even with the things that I have suffered, I have not suffered compared to my Lord. Right? I have not suffered compared to the apostles and some of those who have come before me. So I do thank God for my situation and it is better as it is better than most. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about stress and worry tonight. Before we begin, I want to read uh, a passage from Matthew chapter 6. Many of you are probably familiar with this. If you're not, you will be likely once I start reading from the passage. And the purpose of the lesson tonight is that I hope you take away from this, that there is nothing to worry about when we have true faith. And a few disclaimers and more on that to come. And that truly... If you read through the passages and you have some time to find comfort in the Lord, then you will realize that God is the only place that you will find true comfort and peace. But let's dive into the scriptures and see what it has to say. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. This is Jesus speaking to the apostles and others. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body and what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, nor do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, nor do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon... In all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more so clothe you? O ye of little faith. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have a need of all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. And finally, finishing in verse 34, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Your translations might say the troubles therein. You know, if you read all that, you want a little summary. You've got enough going on today that you don't need to worry about tomorrow. Let's just worry about the things we've got going on right now. The scriptures are chock full 
of times when Jesus is telling his disciples to take comfort and care, right? And believe me, they had plenty to worry about. We have plenty of passages where Paul and Peter are speaking to us and to even those of the day that tell us not to worry. Now, full disclaimer, Jesus is not telling his disciples or anyone else that there's no reason to ever worry about anything or that you're never going to be bothered or you never will experience anxiety because that's just not the case with life, right? He's not saying that we should just walk through life so carefree that we abdicate ourselves from the responsibilities to ourselves or to our families or to our loved ones or the ones we care about. We go through life with such a carefree attitude to think that there's no consequences for the things that we're going to do or the decisions that we make, because that's just not right. We know that. But what he is talking about is unnecessary and undue stress and anxiety, so much so that it takes over your life. Right? Or it causes you to, to not be able to fulfill your responsibilities or your duties as a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter or whatever role that might be in that you're serving. Right? I mean, even the world understands the consequences of stress and worry. If you look at some of the things uh, that even the, what we would call the scientific world uh, would talk about is stress and worry. The consequences of those things are that you feel exhausted all the time. Have you ever been so anxious and so worried or so stressed out about something that you don't even have energy left over to be concerned about the other stuff that you have yet to do? And then on top of that, that just compounds it even worse, right? We're so worried and so caught up and sometimes the inconsequential, right? 95% of the stuff we worry about never even happens. And 85% of statistics are made up on the spot. I don't know that that's true, that most of the stuff we worry about never happens, but oftentimes we concern ourselves with things that don't come to pass. And because we're so caught up in those, we aren't thinking about the things that really need work, or the work that really needs done today, right? Sufficient for the day are its own troubles. Stress and worry can lead to weight gain, which leads to un unhealthy things in your lifestyle. Can lead to libido effects, that's a topic in a sermon for a different day and one I don't want to preach, but it can affect your levels of testosterone in men and estrogen in women, your desire, your drive, your, your love for life, excitement and energy. All of that is just sapped from us when we're sitting around worrying all the time, when we're holding grudges, spending our energy on things we ought not to be spending our energy on. It even makes things hard to remember, you young folks, and, and even sometimes with us older people. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a part of your brain called the hippocampus, and that's what leads to short-term and long-term memory. It's how your mind remembers things, right? It's a, so if you've, if you've ever found yourself to have trouble remembering things that are happening, or maybe you're getting a little bit too forgetful, you know, stress and anxiety can lead to that. So if you're stressing out about finals, we see this a lot with college kids or even high school kids and sometimes even younger these days. They're really pushing some of these kids in school, even at small ages. I know that at one point, even Jenny last year when she was in kindergarten, she'd come home with two hours of homework every day for a kindergartner. Two hours of homework. You want to talk about adding stress not only to her, but to her parents to get through that. But when we allow those things to take over our lives, we're just wasting our time. The chances of you remembering and retaining that information are likely next to none because we're allowing other things to take control of our life. So you might say, OK, we know it's not good for us, but where does it come from? You know, if you're wondering about where stress and anxiety come from, I mean, there might be too many things here to list this evening. Right. I might start to stress you and worry that we're going to go a little long tonight. And for the, the sake of the obvious uh, crowd in here, I'll, we'll leave children out of the mix so we don't give any of the, the, my, my children a complex or anything. But I'd like to submit first that a major part of our stress and our anxiety comes from our work life. We work long hours because we want to provide and we want to do well. That's good, right? There should be a drive. The scriptures tell us to work hard, right? A man that does not provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever, right? Do we have a responsibility to provide for those that are in our charge and our care? Well, of course we do. 
But there comes a point where we have worked so long and so hard and we, we've allowed those things to take control of our lives that we now are so solely concerned with providing financially that we are providing in other places. Emotional support, structure, teaching, discipline. All of those things have gone by the wayside because we work so many hours. Have you seen it yourself or heard about it where a father or a mother is gone from uh, you know dawn till dusk? By the time I'm done working in a day, I only get really about two to three hours with my children on average per day during the week before it's time to. And that time is spent with here, shove some food in your mouth real quick, with get you in the shower, get you washed up, make sure we get your homework done, get you to bed on time, do the story. It's, we're just rushing all the time. And there was a time in this country and even not so long ago where a mother or a father could stay home with their children and spend a little bit more time. But now both parents in the household are working so much that now that's the case where very little time is actually being spent. You want to talk about stress. That's stress. I want to have you flip just one chapter back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, talking about work and those things, uh, maybe allowing to take over our lives so much. I understand that we have a responsibility to provide. But the question that I ask us is, are we working and putting forth the energy we should be putting forth towards the right work? There's a lot of different works you can do, right? You can work one way, provide for your family, go to work, get a job, get a paycheck. But isn't there more work for us as Christians to do? Well, believe me, as, I, as I've gotten older, I realize there is always more work. It's like trying to zip through rush hour. There's always more traffic. You know what I mean? Just, just be ready. You get this task done, there's something else along the way. But in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, the scriptures tell us, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, truly, that's the kind of work that is ultimately rewarding. When the walk in this life is over, Maybe some of us will be remembered for our great achievements at our job. Maybe doubtful. A couple of years later, most companies don't hang up plaques and busts of people in the, in the building to remember all the long and hard hours that they worked. They'll forget about you as fast as you're gone. And maybe some folks will remember you for how much money that you managed to accumulate in your life. And, oh, boy, that, that, you know, that fellow was sure rich. Maybe. But if you want to have a lasting legacy, our work ought to be more focused on the scriptural things, on our walk with Christ, on the influence that we have on young ones. Us men and women here in the church today, we have a responsibility to young kids that often goes unattended. They're not quite getting the attention maybe they did so many years ago. In case you haven't noticed, when you look around, you're seeing less and less young people in the pews these days as the years go by, which makes our job only that much more important, doesn't it? Because we have so few chances as maybe we did before. Have you noticed that you've lost people or have you ever lost someone in the faith? We have so little time, if you think about it, this life is so quick and it's gone. How much time do you have to interact with your Christian family? You could be here next day, or here today, and gone the next. Let your light shine before men. Not so that they can remember us for what good people that we were, no. But that our legacy it might live on. We might have a lasting impression. You never know what uh, that hello or that lesson or that attention might do for a young one or even an, a, a more elderly person to help carry them through the day. I'd say, don't worry. Do your best, and God will provide the rest. Try hard. You know, that's really the, sum the summation of that chapter in Matthew. Jesus doesn't ever tell us that we won't have hard times. He says, when you do have those things, rest on God, and don't worry, he'll take care of you. What about friends? Do you have any friends that cause you to be stressed out or have anxiety? Well, I'll tell you what. 
I made a list of a couple. You want? I'm just kidding. You ever have that? You know, most people want to be well liked. You want to be popular. You want to be well liked. Who doesn't, right? The question I'll ask you, but it, at what cost? There are those who would spend hours in front of a mirror to get ready, to get on just the right clothing, to put on their makeup just the right way. Or maybe they spend hours in the gym to make their body work just to look just a specific type of way. Because they think, well, you know, if I don't look like this or I don't have the best clothes, people just aren't going to like me. Proverbs, the eighth chapter in verse 24, talks a little bit about this. The book of Proverbs is chalked full okay, of valuable information. And when we talk about being with friends and, and being with others and at what cost that is, the Bible tells us that a friend might be closer to you than a brother. A good friend. I want you to, if you get a chance tonight, read through that eighth chapter of Proverbs. The Bible talks about how you don't let things drag you down. People, depths, anxiety, or anything else. Because I will tell you that true friends will do their best not to add to your stress. That's when you know you've got a true friend. They will like you for who you are. They will support you and care for you. And when times are necessary for you to perhaps be rebuked or chastened, they'll do it. That's a true friend. They assess, so I would ask you, assess your relationships. Make sure the relationships that you have fit the mold of a friend in the scriptures. If someone is trying to do you harm or does not have your best interests in mind or is taking you down a path you ought not to go, they are not your friend. And if you are stressing all day long about how they think about you, well, then I think it's time for you to take a good assessment of what that relationship should be like. That is one of the reasons I love this spiritual family. Because you can stand up in front of them and you can quote the wrong verse. And they're not going to just spend all day calling you out. And oftentimes I tell folks, I said, well, if you're going to get into public speaking, this is the place to get started. As long as you don't say anything too crazy, right? <laughs> Most people will be very supportive. We have a wonderful spiritual family. I don't know if you noticed that. Not just here, but in other places. Have you ever been to a congregation and you feel like you've been there a hundred times? There are places like that. Because we share a common bond. And every single person that I have met within the church, I can tell you that there is one thing that is true about every one of them. They all want to see me get to heaven. You ever had somebody cared about you so much? And I can tell you that the folks are here tonight. Every one of them wants to see you get to heaven. Don't let the stress of relationships bother you too much. Focus on the right ones. Let that take up a little bit of your time. Speaking lastly of finding rest from that, where might you find rest? You say, okay, well, I get it. Negative effects. Where does it come from? We all know there's lots of places you can find stress, can't you? Where would you find rest? I want you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, if you would. We're going to speak a little bit about where you can find rest. Verse 16, Paul writing to the Romans says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and to also the Greek. Where can you find rest? The gospel says it has the power to save us. You know, if you think that you got it hard here, think about what an eternity in hell might be like. You know, ultimately, that's what the scriptures are trying to save us from. Not to say that you won't have troubles and toils while you're here. In fact, if you do, you ought to rejoice in them. Because those are the things that produce character and strength in the faith. Those are the things that draw you nearer unto God. Not that you ought to go looking for trouble. Some do. Wouldn't recommend it. 
But the gospel has the power to save us, not physically, but spiritually. You can find rest in these pages. I promise you that no matter what trial you are facing, there is a verse for that. I mean it. Paul goes on further in the 15th chapter of Romans. Just turn a few more pages over. And in verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures we might have hope. Use the good book for your times of trouble. You can find rest in the gospel and you can find rest in Jesus. His words are within these pages. His teachings, his lessons, the story of his life, his sufferings, and ultimately his triumph. And the same triumph that he has promised unto us. The book of John talks about this and he actually talks to his disciples about this in the 16th chapter. Beginning in verse 22... And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. And your joy no man taketh from you. You ever feel like people are trying to take away your joy? If you don't, turn on the news. Open up just about any magazine these days. Jump on any form of social media. Goodness, it is everywhere you got to go through 12 stories of sadness to find one of a, a good story of something, you know, somebody found a rescued dog or something like that after you just got done reading about everything else that's going wrong. But I want you to take rest and comfort in this. Jesus says he will come again, and I believe him. And when he does, he will make sure that the joy that we receive if we are found faithful surpasses any joy you might find here. And it will be lasting. And it will be a joy that no one can take from you. Just a few verses down longer, he in verse 33, he says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He says, you're going to have problems, but cheer up. I have overcome the world. You can't escape disappointment and you can't escape sadness. You will lose loved ones. You will eventually even lose your own life. There is no sequel and nobody's getting out of this thing alive. Sadness and disappointment will come our way. It is a fact of life. If you haven't lost someone near and dear to you, wait a little while. It will likely happen. If you haven't lost your job, you probably haven't worked long enough. Maybe you have, I don't know. Right? These things are going to happen. If you haven't wondered where your next meal is going to come from, or if you've got enough money to get through the week, many of us have had those types of struggles. But Christ says, be of good cheer. He has overcome the world. And through his victory, we too shall overcome the world. The last passage before we bring this to a close will be Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. I want to talk to you about where you can find rest. Jesus speaking to them, and I dare say speaking to you. Take my yoke upon, me, uh, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. When you walk with Christ, you will have comfort. But the walk in Christ will not be easy. And it's going to require some things of you and me. Contrary to common belief and contrary to some of those you might hear preach even today, much is required of one who wants to walk with Christ. It is not a spectator sport. It will not be easy. You will have trials. You will have tribulations. You will have times when you question why we must do a certain thing a certain way. 
There may be even times where your faith will struggle. But walk with him. Because the only way we will ever be separated from Christ is if we make that choice ourselves. He will never leave you. Don't lose hope, especially when things seem hopeless. We talked about tools of the adversary this morning. Anxiety, worry, stress, hopelessness, those are all very powerful tools. And at one point or another, you and I will struggle with all of those things, and maybe even some of them at the same time. But look to God and look to the scriptures to find your answers. And ultimately, I beg of you, if you have not, before you leave this day, look to Christ for that comfort. He has spelled out very clearly in the passages what is required to walk with him. That one would hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And live a faithful life unto death. And for those of us who have ever struggled with our faith, or we have fallen away, or we have allowed uh, the adversary to tempt us in a way that he ought not, we have also likewise been provided comfort and rest. Jesus says, confess and pray, and I am faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What a powerful friend we have in Jesus. If you have need to obey the gospel, we stand ready to help you. If you struggle with any of these, call me. And if you're just in need of prayers of the congregation or anything else, we stand ready to assist you. Won't you come forward while we stand and sing the invitation song?